Hey, David, how are you? James, how are, how are you today? Yeah, it looks like uh, winter maybe is settling in in Ohio, however, correct? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, I'm going out there every day, sometimes twice a day now, because we're in the middle of a snowstorm, and it just seems to pile up, and, and the poor deer come right up to the house to eat off the holly bushes. Uh, they're having a little bit of trouble foraging for food right now. So we're, we're in the midst of it right now. Okay, so you're actually out there physically shoveling shit snow? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I do that every day, like I said. But I have this honking big snowblower, and it works really well. Clears off the driveway in no time flat. But the good thing about it is it makes it look like I did a lot of work. So, you know, I get kudos <laughs> from the wife. And she's really <laughs> impressed with that. And it looks like I really did something. Yeah, well, kudos from the wife are important. I, I agree. Now, tell us about Arizona. What what took place down there? Oh uh, yeah, you know, uh, I very rarely write about knives. You know, I write about the right to keep their arms, and, and typically focus that on on the gun issue. And I received a uh, link from several different readers about a New York Times article, and this was dealing with knife rights in Arizona. And apparently, what they've done there is they have eliminated the patchwork quilt of laws and they have gone for state preemption which the Arizona Police Chiefs Association uh, and this this kind of puzzled me they were against it they, they were saying somehow it was more in the interest of the state and the people to have this patchwork quilt of confusing laws so that you might be legal in Phoenix, but now all of a sudden you're going to be illegal in Tucson and legal again in Yuma. And it just makes absolutely no sense. And what, what that actually does is it more or less mirrors the uh, system that we have uh, where you don't know going from state to state and city to city if what you have in your possession and on your person is legal or illegal. And so by going ahead and going for preemption and getting rid of the patchwork, that was a good step in the right direction for Arizonans. Yeah, you, you know, David, I just want to make, I want to make a comment here because uh, a lot of people don't understand that your right to carry a knife is part of the Second Amendment. Absolutely. It's, it's like they are arms, as swords are arms. And, James, truth be known, anything can be used as a weapon. And the laws against knives are particularly ridiculous because that cat is already out of the bag. Okay, a knife is the most ubiquitous of tools that we have available to us. We all have them available in our kitchen. I've got steak knives, I've got big butcher knives for cutting things up. Uh, I'm making fajitas tonight and my wife was just in the kitchen with her Hamilton Beach fully automatic assault knife cutting up the meat strips for me so that I can make the fajitas later on tonight. Uh, you, you know, David, l l let me stop you right there because, you know, I enjoy reading your blog and, and everyone should read it as, as often. If, if you're not uh, receiving David's blog, I'm telling you, you're missing a lot of information there. And as I read your blog, uh, it comes to a surprise to me, oh, it shouldn't, I suppose, uh, that the UK has come out with some kind of a knife now uh, because of uh, knife issues uh, where it, I don't know, it's a rubber knife. Uh, what kind of knife did they come out with that is deemed harmless? They, 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 they call it an anti-stab knife. And apparently what this has is this has a rounded tip so that if you attempt to stab someone with it, uh, I guess what you're going to do is you're going to bludgeon them to death. I'm not sure exactly how that works. But again, if you're, you know, most knife fighters I know of teach slashing techniques. Uh, you know, so how, how this would protect you if it's going to be, you know, any use at all in terms of have any utility for the function that it was designed for, what is it that we're talking about? If you can slash with a knife, you have either a kitchen tool or a potentially lethal instrument. And yeah. that all depends, of course, on the user, just as with firearms, just as, just as with anything. James, when, once you start trying to regulate pieces of metal that anyone can get their hands on, and I think that's what scared people, and that's what led to some of the initial 
laws that we have in this country and elsewhere, it just you might as well start trying to ban rocks and sticks and things of that nature. Because yeah, you, you know, this is you know, this is a, I find this especially funny because you know I know that many of us have been to the UK and they have some wonderful restaurants there, and, and they set to use the English word a proper table now, and they usually have silverware. So I can't imagine that the UK is switching over to some kind of a non-lethal blunt knife and that you would go to dinner and, and this would be on the table instead of a, you know, which would be a proper knife. Uh, well, this, I, this, I, this was not at the time a mandate. However, the British government was looking at it and they were making laudatory comments for it and mentioning it as being useful in their fight against crimes of violence, which of course is patently ridiculous. And, and if you read the uh, column on knives, you'll also see that I made reference to the fact that there was a move to ban glasses for the pints in pubs so that people could not use those as a weapon and somehow or other replace them with plastic. I, I don't know if they had sippy cups like we give to infants in mind or possibly bottles, uh, you know, with, with uh, rubber, you know, Gerber nipples on them or something like that. But it's just ridiculous, James. You know, we are either adults who are entrusted with the rigors and responsibilities of freedom as well as the benefits of freedom, or we are not. And if you cannot trust a hum an individual with a knife, that person needs to be locked up and locked away from us because, well, as I said, uh, you, know what? You, anything, you make you make a good point there, David. I mean, if you're going to start passing laws about knives, you know, how about rocks and sticks? I, I mean, where does it end? We, I think, yeah. we've pretty well established that it's not the weapon; it's the person, not the and, weapon. And again, <laughs> get, getting back to the patchwork of laws, you know, it's like uh, the feds passed a switchblade law back in 1958, and. Basically, what it says is on federal property and territories and protectorates in Washington, D.C., you cannot have a switchblade and you cannot, I guess, sell and produce and manufacture switchblades in interstate commerce. However, the various states have their own laws on it. I understand New Hampshire just uh, went ahead and said that it's okay to have them. Sometimes you can have them if they're under three inches. Uh, the federal law has an exemption. If you have one arm, you can have it. And, and I just started laughing when I saw that because I remembered the fugitive and Dr. Richard Kimball was chasing the one-armed man who killed his wife. And, you know, it's just like I looked for Ohio and it said that the law there is uncertain. Well, how are we supposed to conduct ourselves if you go here and it's legal, you go the other place and all of a sudden you're committing some kind of a felony? We can't live our lives like that. And in fact, the federal system that they have in place now, with uh, it, it, it almost seems exactly the opposite of what they're doing fighting the Firearms Freedom Act. And it just, it's untenable, but there is an organization out there, and it's called Knife Rights. And uh, KnifeRights.org, I believe, is their URL. And they have a companion organization, which is a foundation. So one of them does the, the lobbying, I guess, and the other does the education. But it's well worth looking into because, again, uh, this is our right, and we have to be aware of our rights so that we can protect them, and we have to be able to join with people who are facilitating us doing exactly that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to say this one last time. It is about the Second Amendment. Well, this, and the Second Amendment really is about the unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the ability to protect that. And, you know, it's, it's been well recognized that the Second Amendment does not create or grant our right to keep and bear arms. It articulates and recognizes that this is our right in natural law. And the bottom line is knives are part and parcel of that. Thanks. But by the same token, we have politicians who, for reasons of their own, we have hysterical people out there who want to ban things and want to control things. And it's up to us to not only know what our rights are, but also to be cognizant of what the laws are in our areas and where we go in case we run afoul of things. We have to know, you know how to protect ourselves legally as well as physically.
Yeah, before I let you go, David, didn't I see a samurai sword or, or something on your mantle? Uh, I have a big broadsword. It, it's actually called a hand and a half sword or a bastard sword is what they called it. And that's aluminum. It's not a real sword. It is a prop. Uh, I think I told you some time ago I was involved in an independent filmmaking project where they cast me as the villain, naturally. And I choreographed a, a sword fight, and my opponent, who was the good guy, actually had real armor and a real sword. But because this thing was just so heavy and unwieldy, in order to do the moves, I didn't feel safe practicing with a real sword. I, I thought I could actually hurt him, so I had a guy make me one out of <laughs> aluminum. Okay. okay, David. Thank you. We'll see you again next week. Okay, I'll try to dig out by then, James. Thanks. <laughs> okay,